Section 17 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 37. Regency of Mary de' Medici, 1610-1617. Part 2. This modest style of language did not prevent Marshal d'Ancre from occasionally having strange fits of domineering arrogance. Quote, By God, sir, he wrote to one of his friends, I have to complain of you. You treat for peace without me. You have caused the Queen to write to me that, for her sake, I must give up the suit I had commenced against M. de Montbazon to get paid what he owes me. In all the devil's names, what do the Queen you take me for? I am devoured to my very bones with rage. End quote in his dread lest influence opposed to his own should be exercised over the young king he took upon himself to regulate his amusements and his walks and prohibited him from leaving paris louis the thirteenth had amongst his personal attendants a young nobleman albert de luynes clever in training little sporting birds called butcher birds or pi griche or shriek then all the rage and the king made him his falconer and lived on familiar terms with him playing at billiards one day marshal d'ancre putting on his hat said to the king quote, i hope your majesty will allow me to be covered End quote. the king allowed it but remained surprised and shocked his young page albert de luynes observed his displeasure and being anxious himself also to become a favourite he took pains to fan it a domestic plot was set hatching against marshal d'ancre what was its extent and who were the accomplices in it this is not clear however it may have been on the twenty fourth of april sixteen seventeen m de vitry captain of the guard or capitaine de quartier that day in the royal army which was besieging soissons ordered some of his officers to provide themselves with a pistol each in their pockets and he himself went to that door of the louvre by which the king would have to go to the queen mother's when marshal d'ancre arrived at this door quote, there is the marshal said one of the officers and vitry laid hands upon him saying quote, marshal i have the king's orders to arrest you quote, me said the marshal in surprise and attempting to resist the officer fired upon him and so did several others it was never known or at any rate never told whose shot it was that hit him but quote, sir said colonel d'ornano going up to the young king you are this minute king of france marshal d'ancre is dead End quote. and the young king before the assembled court repeated with the same tone of satisfaction quote, marshal d'ancre is dead End quote. baron de vitry was appointed marshal of france in the room of the favourite whom he had just murdered the day after the murder the mob rushed into the church of saint germain lacherois where the body of marshal d'ancre had been interred they heaved up the slabs hauled the body from the ground dragged it over the pavement as far as the pont neuf where they hanged it by the feet to a gallows and they afterwards tore it in pieces which were sold burned and thrown into the seine the ferocious passions of the populace were satisfied but court hatred and court envy were not they attacked the marshal's widow leonora galigai she resided at the louvre and at the first rumour of what had happened she had sent to demand asylum with the queen mother meeting with a harsh refusal she had undressed herself in order to protect with her body her jewels which she had concealed in her mattresses the moment she was discovered she was taken to the bastille and brought before the parliament she began by throwing all the blame upon her husband it was he she said who had prevented her from retiring into italy and who had made every attempt to push his fortunes farther when she was sentenced to death leonora recovered her courage and pride Quote, never said a contemporary was anybody seen of more constant and resolute visage Quote, what a lot of people to look at one poor creature said she at sight of the crowd that thronged upon her passage there is nothing to show that her firmness at the last earned her more of sympathy than her weaknesses had brought her of compassion the mob has its seasons of pitilessness leonora galigai died leaving one child a son who was so maltreated that he persisted in refusing all food and at last would take nothing but the sweetmeats that the young queen anne of austria married two years before to louis the thirteenth had the kindness to send him we encounter in this very insignificant circumstance a trace of one of those important events which marked the earliest years of mary de medici's regency and the influence of her earliest favourites concini and his wife both of them probably in the secret service of the court of madrid had promoted the marriage of louis the thirteenth with the infanta anne of austria eldest daughter of philip the third king of spain and that of philip 
Infante of Spain, who was afterwards Philip IV, with Princess Elizabeth of France, sister of Louis XIII. Henry IV, in his plan for the pacification of Europe, had himself conceived this idea, and testified a desire for this double marriage, but without taking any trouble to bring it about. It was after his death that on the 30th of April, 1612, Villeroy, Minister of Foreign Affairs in France, and Don Inigo de Caderias, ambassador of the King of Spain, concluded this double union by a formal deed. They signed on the same day at Fontainebleau, between the King and Queen Regent of France on one side, and the King of Spain on the other, a treaty of defense of alliance to the effect, quote, that those sovereigns should give one another mutual succor against such as should attempt anything against their kingdoms or revolt against their authority, that they should in such case send one to the other at their own expense for six months a body of six thousand foot and twelve hundred horse, that they should not assist any criminal charged with high treason, and should even give them over into the hands of the ambassadors of the king who claimed them, end quote. It is quite certain that Henry the Fourth would never have let his hands be thus tied by a treaty so contrary to his general policy of alliance with Protestant powers such as England and the United Provinces. He had no notion of servile subjection to his own policy, but he would have given good care not to abandon it. He was of those who, under delicate circumstances, remain faithful to their ideas and promises without systematic obstinacy and with a due regard for the varying interests and requirements of their country and their age. The two Spanish marriages were regarded in France as an abandonment of the national policy. France was, in a great majority, Catholic, but its Catholicism differed essentially from the Spanish Catholicism. It affirmed the entire separation of the temporal power and the spiritual power, and the inviolability of the former by the latter. It refused assent, moreover, to certain articles of the Council of Trent. It was Gallican Catholicism determined to keep a pretty large measure of national independence, political and moral, as opposed to Spanish Catholicism, essentially devoted to the cause of the papacy and of absolutist Austria under the influence of this public feeling the two spanish marriages and the treaty which accompanied them were unfavorably regarded by a great part of france a remedy was desired it was hoped that one would be found in the convocation of the states-general of the kingdom to which the populace always looked expectantly they were convoked first for the sixteenth of september sixteen fourteen at, at sens and afterwards for the twentieth of october following when the young king louis the thirteenth after the announcement of his majority himself opened them in state amongst the members there were one hundred and forty of the clergy one hundred and thirty-two of the noblesse and one hundred and ninety-two of the third estate the clergy elected for their president cardinal de joyeuse who had crowned mary de medici the noblesse henry de beauframont baron of senecy and the third estate robert miron provo of the tradesmen of paris these elections were not worth much and have left no trace on history the chief political fact connected with the convocation of the states general of sixteen fourteen was the entry into their ranks of the youthful bishop of luçon armand jean du plessis de richelieu marked out by the finger of god to sustain after the powerful reign of henry the fourth and the incapable regency of mary de medici the weight of the government of france he was in two cases elected to the states general by the clergy of loudun and by that of poitou as he was born on the fifth of september fifteen eighty five he was but twenty-eight years old in sixteen fourteen he had not been destined for the church and he was pursuing a layman's course of study at the college of navarre under the name of the marquis de chillon when his elder brother alphonse louis du plessis de richelieu became disgusted with ecclesiastical life turned carthusian and resigned the unpretending bishopric of luçon in favour of his brother armand whom henry the fourth nominated to it in sixteen o five instructing cardinal du perron at that time his charge d'affaires at rome to recommend to pope paul v that election which he had very much at heart the young prelate betook himself with so much ardour to his theological studies that at twenty years of age he was a doctor and maintained his theses in rochet and camaille as bishop nominate at rome some objection was still made to his extreme youth but he hastened thither and delivered before the pope a latin harangue which scattered all objections to the wind after consecration at rome in sixteen o seven he returned to paris and hastened to take possession of his see at luçon quote, the poorest and the nastiest in france as he himself said he could support poverty but he also set great store by riches and he was seriously anxious for the expenses of his installation quote, 
taking after you that is being a little vain he wrote to one of his fair friends madame de bourges with whom he was on terms of familiar correspondence about his affairs i should very much like being more easy in my circumstances to make more show but what can i do no house no carriage furnished apartments are inconvenient i must borrow a coach horses and a coachman in order to at least arrive at luçon with a decent turnout he purchased second-hand the velvet bed of one madame de marsonnet his aunt he made for himself a muff out of a portion of his uncle the commander's martin skins silver plate he was very much concerned about Quote, I beg you, he wrote to Madame de Bourges, to send me word what will be the cost of two dozen silver dishes of fair size, as they are made now. I should very much like to get them for five hundred crowns, for my resources are not great. I am quite sure that for a matter of a hundred crowns more you would not like me to have anything common. I am a beggar, as you know, in such sort that I cannot do much in the way of playing the opulent. But at any rate, when I have silver dishes, my nobility will be considerably enhanced." End quote. He succeeded, no doubt, in getting his silver dishes and his well-appointed episcopal mansion, for when in 1614 he was elected to the States General, he had acquired amongst the clergy and at the court of Louis XIII sufficient importance to be charged with the duty of speaking, in presence of the king, on the acceptance of the acts of the Council of Trent, and on the restitution of certain property belonging to the Catholic Church in Vaughan he made skilful use of the occasion for the purpose of still further exalting and improving the question and his own position he complained that for a long time past ecclesiastics had been too rarely summoned to the sovereign's councils quote, as if the honour of serving god he said rendered them incapable of serving the king end quote he took care at the same time to make himself pleasant to the mighty ones of the hour he praised the young king for having on announcing his majority asked his mother to continue to watch over france and quote, to add to the august title of mother of the king that of mother of the kingdom end quote. the post of almoner to the queen regnant anne of austria was his reward he carried still further his ambitious foresight in february fifteen sixteen at the time when the session of the states-general closed marshal d'ancre and leonora galigai were still favourites with the queen-mother richelieu laid himself out to be pleasant to them and received from the marshal in sixteen sixteen the post of secretary of state for war and foreign affairs marshal d'ancre was at that time looking out for supporters against his imminent downfall when in sixteen seventeen he fell and was massacred people were astonished to find richelieu on good terms with the marshal's court rival albert de luynes who pressed him to remain in the council at which he had sat for only five months to what extent was the bishop of luçon at that time on terms of understanding with the victor there is no saying but to accept the responsibility of the new favourite's accession was a compromising act richelieu judged it more prudent to remain bishop of luçon and to wear the appearance of defeat by following mary de medici to blois whither since the fall of her favourites she had asked leave to retire he would there he said be more useful to the government of the young king for remaining at the side of mary de medici he would be able to advise her and restrain her he so completely persuaded louis the thirteenth and albert de luynes that he received orders to set out for blois with the queen-mother which he did on the fourth of may sixteen seventeen the bishop of luçon though still young was already one of the ambitious sort who stake their dignity upon the ultimate success of their fortunes success gained no matter at what price by address or by hardihood by complaisance or by opposition according to the requirements of facts and times dignity apart the young bishop had accurately measured the expediency of the step he was taking in the interest of his future high-soaring ambition on arriving at blois with the queen-mother he began by dividing his life between that petty court in disgrace and his diocese of luçon he wished to set albert de luynes at rest as to his presence at the court of mary de medici the devotion he showed her and the counsels he gave her he had but small success however the new favourite was suspicious and anxious richelieu appeared to be occupied with nothing but the duties of his office he presided at conferences and he published against the protestants a treatise entitled the complete christian or de la perfection du chrétien luynes was not disposed to believe in these exclusively religious preoccupations he urged upon the king that richelieu should not live constantly in the queen-mother's neighbourhood and in june sixteen seventeen he had orders given him to retire to the courtship of avignon 
Pope Paul V complained that the Bishop of Lisson was exiled from his diocese. Quote, what is to be done about residence, said he, which is due to his bishopric? And what will the world say at seeing him prohibited from going whither his duty binds him to go? End quote. The king answered that he was surprised at the Pope's complaint. Quote, an ecclesiastic, said he, could not possibly be in any better place than Avignon, church territory. My lord the bishop of Luson is far from finding time for nothing but the exercises of his profession. I have discovered that he indulged in practices prejudicial to my service. He is one of those spirits that are carried away far beyond their duty, and are very dangerous in times of public disorder. Richelieu obeyed without making any objection. He passed two years at Avignon, protesting that he would never depart from it without the consent of Luin, and without the hope of serving him. The favour and fortune of the young falconer went on increasing every day. He had, in 1617, married the daughter of the Duke of Montbasson, and in 1619 prevailed upon the king to have the estate of Mai raised for him to a duchy peerage under the title of Luynes in sixteen twenty one he procured for himself the dignity of constable to which he had no military claim louis the thirteenth sometimes took a malicious pleasure in making fun of his favourite's cupidity and that of his following quote, i never saw said he one person with so many relatives they come to court by shiploads and not a single one of them with a silk dress quote, see said he one day to the count of bassompierre pointing to luynes surrounded by a numerous following he wants to play the king but i shall know how to prevent it i will make him disgorge what he has taken from me End quote. friends at court warned luynes of this language and luynes replied with a somewhat disdainful impertinence quote, it is good for me to cause the king a little vexation from time to time it revives the affection he feels for me End quote. Richelieu kept himself well informed of court rumours, and was cautious not to treat them with indifference. He took great pains to make himself pleasant to the young constable. Quote, My lord, he wrote to him in August 1621, I am extremely pleased to have an opportunity of testifying to you that I shall never have any possession that I shall not be most happy to employ for the satisfaction of the king and yourself the queen did me the honour of desiring that i should have the abbey of redon but the moment i knew that the king and you my lord were desirous of disposing of it otherwise i gave it up with very good cheer in order that being in your hands you might gratify therewith whomsoever you pleased assuring you my lord that i have more contentment in testifying to you thereby that which you will on every occasion recognise in me than i should have had by an augmentation of four thousand crowns income the queen is very well thank god I think it will be very meet that from time to time, by means of those who are passing, you should send her news of the king, and of you and yours, which will give her great satisfaction. End quote. Letters of Cardinal Richelieu, page 690. Whilst Richelieu was thus behaving towards the favourite with complacence and modesty, Mary de Medici, whose mouthpiece he appeared to be, assumed a very different posture, and used different language she complained bitterly of the slavery and want of money to which she was reduced at blois a plot on the part of both aristocrats and domestics were contrived by those about her to extricate her she entered into secret relations with a great a turbulent and a malcontent lord the duke of epernon two florentine servants ruccellet and vincenti ludovice were their go-betweens and it was agreed that she should escape from blois and take refuge at angouleme a lordship belonging to the duke of epernon she at the same time wrote to the king to plead for more liberty he replied quote, madame having understood that you have a wish to visit certain places of devotion i am rejoiced thereat i shall be still more pleased if you take a resolution to move about and travel henceforward more than you have done in the past i consider that it will be of great service to your health which is extremely precious to me if business permitted me to be of the party i would accompany you with all my heart End quote mary replied to him with formal assurances of fidelity and obedience she promised before god and his angels quote, to have no correspondence which could be prejudicial to the king's service to warn him of all intrigues which should come to her knowledge that were opposed to his will and to entertain no design of returning to court save when it should please the king to give her orders to do so End quote. There was between the king, the queen mother, Albert de Luynne, the Duke of Epernon, and their agents, an exchange of letters and empty promises which deceived scarcely anybody, and which destroyed all confidence as well as all truthfulness between them. 
the duke of epernon protested that he had no idea of disobeying the king's commands but that he thought his presence was more necessary for the king's service in angoumois than at metz he complained at the same time that for two years past he had received from the court only the simple pay of a colonel at ten months for the year which took it out of his power to live suitably to his rank he set out for metz at the end of january sixteen nineteen saying quote, i am going to take the boldest step i ever took in my life End, quote. End of section seventeen.